Here we're going to start our study of reaction mechanisms. Our goal here is to describe a reaction mechanism and see what kind of differential rate law that predicts. Or conversely, given differential rate law, what kind of reaction mechanisms are consistent with that. We talked about rate law, and this is the form of a rate law. We're talking about the simplest one that we'll consider here today. That'd be the zeroth order rate law, which means that the rate, again, we're defining rate as how concentration of changes with time. The zero order will be k, and all reactant concentrations here will be raised to the zeroth power, and of course that will just be 1. So this is a very simple rate law here. Oftentimes, we'll want not only the rate law, but also the integrated rate law. So if one compares the rate law with the integrated rate law here, this is a differential equation. If we integrate that, we can get the how the concentration of a particular reactant or product changes with time. Oftentimes, it's useful to have this, because what one does in a typical kinetic experiment is to measure as a function of time for instance, the concentration of A. So at time equals zero, we'll have a certain concentration and so on. So this is your actual experimental data, how A changes with time. And the integrated rate law gives that how A changes with time. So we can compare directly our experimental data from one particular experiment with the rate law, integrated rate law, and see whether this data is consistent with a particular uh, reaction mechanism. And of course this is the rate law which we can determine by seeing how the rate changes with various concentrations. Alright, so that's where we're going. We're going to look at various reaction mechanisms and see what kind of differential rate law that gives in form of a differential equation. We're going to integrate that and see what kind of integrated rate law that gives. All right, so starting with the zeroth order reaction, we have how a rate just depends on, well, no concentrations. It's just a constant. Recall that k is the rate constant. And the rate constant, as the name implies, is a constant at a particular temperature. It doesn't depend on concentration. So let's uh, take that equation and see what that predicts here. So the zeroth order rate law, dA dt, the rate, is just a constant. And all these concentrations here are raised to the zero power. So we just have a constant rate. So there's the rate law, the differential form. Let's integrate this. So we'll put all the things that uh, vary on one side. So this will be integral of dA. That would just be the integral of k times dt. Let me get rid of that. And put a dt there. There we go. Now we have a couple choices. One, we can, to integrate this equation, we can make a definite integral, or we can do an indefinite integral. All right, so for a definite integral, we have to specify some initial conditions. So let's say at time equals zero, a is equal to a zero. Then we could put limits on these, integra these integral signs here and determine the definite integral. So let's do that, the integral We'll go from a0 to a. a here will be just a function of time, dA. And that'll be equal to, well, a0, time is 0. And at some particular time t, the concentration here is a. This is k dt. Um, sorry, yeah, k dt. So this will be a minus a0. That will just be equal to k times time. So there's our the integrated form of the rate law, which we have down here. Let's go the indefinite integral way. So here we have an integral, and we're doing this in a lot of detail here. I mean, if you have a good background in calculus, you're probably, oh, why is he doing this step by step? But it'll be useful later on, and when we talk about more complex reaction mechanisms. Let's do the indefinite integral, dA. That will be the integration here of k dt. And so this would be a. We integrate this, we get a. We integrate this, we get kt. And then, we have, because we have an indefinite integral, we have the integration constant b. Now, to determine what the integration constant b is, well, we use some initial conditions, or some. we have to know what a is at some particular time. Hey, just let's use that. So at time equals 0, a is equal to a0. 
So we put that time equals zero, a is equal to a zero, a zero is equal to zero plus b, or the integration constant b is just then a zero. You put that in here, and so you have a is kt plus a zero, and that is the same thing we have here. So essentially we can either apply our, in this case, initial conditions before we do the integration, or you can wait afterwards and apply the initial conditions in order to get the integration constant. So there it is. So that's the integrated rate law determined in a couple different ways. Now let's uh, look a little more closely than that, than that. We did all these mathematics and found, oh yeah, that's, but we are chemists. There's a reason why we became chemists rather than mathematicians, and that is we have one foot grounded in reality. And so let's look a little more carefully about what these, what this integrated form means. One way to do that is let's look at limits. So say as uh, time approaches infinity, so this is where the reaction goes to equilibrium. What, this, what does this mean? Well, let's see. We have a minus a zero, that's equal to kt. So as time goes to infinity, this implies that a minus a zero goes to infinity, or a, we'll just add a zero on both that side. This is a constant, which is small compared to infinity. This means a goes to infinity. What the heck does this mean? A, the concentration, we're chemists, we can't have infinite concentrations, so this is not making too much sense. Hmm. Or, well, let's look at another way. Uh, let's write the integrated rate law, A minus A zero is equal to KT. So this implies, because this is greater than zero, and time is greater than zero, so remember the rate constant, we said that's a positive number. So this implies that a minus a zero will be greater than zero, which means that a will be greater than a zero. A zero is a positive number. What does this mean, you know? Well, and this thing's here. So what we've concluded is that the, this reaction mechanism, which gives a zero order reaction, this uh, really has no uh, physical meaning. What this means is that A is being, is changing with time at a constant rate. And as chemists, we would think that the concentration of A, the amount of A in a chemical reaction would eventually go away because you've reacted it all over some product. It would eventually reach a maximum because you used up all the reactant. But here it's implying that like A is infinity or it just doesn't make sense. So it looks like a zero order reaction mechanism is approximation and perhaps at some particular time you might have a reaction that has a the rate um, of product appearance or reactant disappearance will be a constant, but it doesn't hold for the entire time domain. So zero order reaction, yeah, yeah approximation, but through over the entire range of a chemical reaction, that doesn't really work. Mathematics, yeah, but chemists, we're, we're re real chemists. We ground in reality. Anything that we talk about, great, make theories of in physical chemistry always has to be related to experiment. Whereas if we were mathematicians, we could live in our own world.